The book, George Washington's Spy Master, details a less well-known but equally fascinating aspect of George Washington's impressive legacy. Today we are going to summarize the book for you. So let's get started. How's it going everybody? Welcome to Virtual History 360. I'm Mr. Wade and today we are looking at the book George Washington's Spy Master by Thomas B. Allen. I got a copy right here. This book focuses on George Washington's legacy in espionage, which is a subject that generally attracts less attention than his roles as a military general and U.S. president. Part of this includes a heavy emphasis on the culprit spying, which fed the colonial army crucial information, including the revelation of Benedict Arnold's plan to turn over West Point to the British. Beginning our summary, we start with a brief recap of Washington's life before the Revolutionary War. We learn that George was a descendant of John Washington, who immigrated from Great Britain to the United States in 1656, with George being born in 1732 in the colony of Virginia. At the age of 10, when his father died, Washington inherited a small farm and 10 slaves. Now, although he never went to school formally, Washington learned mathematics and writing throughout his childhood and young adulthood. At the age of 20, in the year 1752, Washington received the appointment or commission of major in the Virginia militia. Though Washington rose to the rank of colonel during the early years of the French and Indian War, a key military defeat, along with a series of power struggles within the colonial army, led to Washington's resignation. I'll tell you what, if you want to learn more about Fort Necessity and Washington's role during the French and Indian War, check out this video here, somewhere in this upper right hand corner. Okay? Now, having learned a great deal from these struggles, Washington joined the staff of British General Edward Braddock as an aide. Over the next few years, Washington redeemed himself in the eyes of the military elite, owing to a series of tactical successes. But after the war, he retired back to Virginia. Now, once again a civilian, Washington married Martha Dandridge Custis, the widow of a wealthy plantation owner. This, by marrying and inheriting hers, this made Washington one of the wealthiest men in the Virginia colony. His wealthy status, along with his reputation as a war hero, allowed him to hold a series of political positions, including serving in the Virginia Provincial Legislature. During the 1760s, his opposition to British Parliament intensified in the wake of a series of royal proclamations, including the prohibition on settling land west of the Allegheny Mountains and the controversial Stamp Act, which was a tax on printed materials that Washington termed, quote, an act of oppression. Now, when the American Revolutionary War began in 1775, Washington was nominated by John and Samuel Adams to be Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army. All right, now we're getting into the good stuff. You see, Washington long considered espionage, or spying to gather intelligence, to be a key component of a successful military campaign against the British. One of his earliest agents was Captain Nathan Hale, who volunteered to embark on an intelligence gathering mission in New York City. Now, unfortunately, the loyalist Robert Rogers captured Hale, delivering him to the British to be executed. I am sure you have heard his famous last words. He said, quote, I only regret is that I have but one life to lose for my country. Well, after Hale's execution, Washington was convinced that civilians would be better suited to act as spies because they would be less likely to draw attention. His first civilian spy was general store owner Nathaniel Sackett. Though Sackett was unable to complete many of the initiatives assigned to him, he created a vast network of spies that would serve as an indispensable resource to Sackett's replacement, Benjamin Talmadge. Using Sackett's network as a foundation, Talmadge, at the time known by his codename John Bolton, Talmadge built a vast and effective espionage network known as the Culper Spy Ring. It was named for Samuel Culper, the codename of Abraham Woodhull, 
one of Talmadge's neighbors recruited to enlist spies and gather intelligence. The methods of gathering and transmitting this intelligence were rather sophisticated. For example, coffee shop owner and reporter Robert Townsend, who was codenamed Samuel Culper Jr., would write articles in favor of the British. Having proved himself as a loyalist to Britain, this would grant him access to social events where members of the British elite gathered. Townsend then reported any potential valuable information to a local woman named Anna Strong. Anna Strong then transmitted a message to the colonial army by arranging clothes in a specific way or specific order on her clothesline. How crazy is that? Shipping businessman Caleb Brewster transmitted messages between Long Island and Connecticut on the whaling ship he operated. Other tactics used by Washington included having members of the spy ring spread disinformation and false propaganda, exaggerating the size of the American army in order to scare the British. Not a bad idea. Washington also employed quote-unquote lone wolf spies who operated outside the culprit ring. The most notable of these was Hercules Mulligan, who needs no introduction. O oops, sorry, wrong video. Anyway, Mulligan, who along with his slave Cato, delivered information about an imminent capture attempt with, that likely saved Washington's life. All right. Arguably, the Culper Spiring's biggest success came in 1780 when the network uncovered the British Army's plan to ambush French troops before they had a chance to provide aid to the colonial army. This forced the British to alter their plans and postpone the attack. And thanks to Woodhull's sister, Mary Underhill, the ring was able to capture British Major John Andre, who had been colluding with Benedict Arnold to turn over the critical West Point fort to the British. Wow, that's a lot. Hopefully that covers the book. So I'm going to ask, what about you? Now that you've heard this brief summary, are you interested in reading this book? Have you read it before? Tell me in the comments below. I want to hear what you think. While you're there, Go ahead and hit the like button for me so YouTube knows to share this video with everyone. And don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. You know, if, that's button, if that button is red, let's turn it gray. And be sure to check out these other videos that you see to the side over here somewhere. I have other history videos that go over revolutionary battles and different uh, aspects of American government and civics videos. I even have videos that are shot in 360 that you can look all the way around. So be sure to check them out because I know you're going to like them. For Virtual History 360, I'm Mr. Wade. I'll see you next time.